It's a pleasure to be in such a nicely proportioned building and natural materials and lots of craftsmanship. I always find that that uh, makes me feel, feel good uh, right at the beginning. And it's something we've slightly lost in more recent uh, architectural conceptions. But um, and pra perhaps I should be saying something like Prananda or Noswaidvar or Nosda. I don't know which one officially we're in at the moment, but it's somewhere towards the evening. And um, I'm just practicing my Welsh, which isn't very good. Um, <laughs> Can we have this light off? Would anybody mind if I just put the light off a little bit? Just, just, or dimmed it, I, I don't mind. Um, so I've been asked to talk about inquiry by design, which is one of the key tools that the Princess Foundation have, are well known for, um, for a long time. And uh, we've been using it to develop master plans all over the country and internationally. And um, inquiry by design is something which I'll be talking about all the way through, but not, not, not specifically. Uh, it's related to some work we've been doing in the in the in the UK recently with the, the British with the, with the UK government with the English English, English government, and um, you, you'll you'll see how it's been adapted to take account of uh, the localism of the bill and what's happening there, and um, I, I hope you'll get a, a bit of a perspective on that uh, as we go through. Um, the foundation teaches and demonstrates sustainable development, placing community and engagement at the heart of its work. And um, we have fairly recently changed our strapline from the foundation for building, for, for the built environment to the foundation for building community. And it's a little bit reflective of the, uh, of the kind of work that we're now doing. Um, <clears throat> so I'm sure you're very um, familiar with these things, but uh, we believe sustainably, sustainability plan, built and maintain communities, improve the quality of everyone's life who is a part of them. I mean, no one's going to argue about these things. They help us both to live better at a local level and start dealing with the broader global challenges of uh, urban, urbanization and climate change. So we're looking at localism, but we're also looking at uh, solutions to the global problem. Uh, our goal is, to, uh, is, is a future where all of us can take part in making our own communities more sustainable. We're work working with everyone from local residents groups to governments, making it happen in the UK and internationally. Um, <clears throat> the f for those who don't know, the foundation, uh, and I, I, I'm now the, re the Welsh representative, in, uh, uh, only, only quite recently, so I'm still getting to know the, the geography around here. One of 19 charities headed up by the Prince of Wales, an educational charity which exists to improve the quality of people's lives, blah, 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 um, and consists of planners, architects, urban designers, and other built environment professionals. And uh, we've engaged with communities in planning design for their neighbourhoods for the past 15 or, t or 20 years. Uh, so you, the, the most well-known, of course, is the Prince's Trust as a charity. Um, but there's, all, there's uh, many others. There's the traditional arts. There's build, build, uh, business in the community. And then there's um, uh, and, and, and the Prince's Regeneration Trust, who we work with uh, quite a lot. And um, then we have partnerships with other kinds of uh, organisations in educational fields, uh, Simon Fraser University in Canada and the uh, Cambridge University with, a, an, a, I think it's an MSc in uh, Sustainable Urbanism. Um, <clears throat> so, Inquiry by Design and the Localism Agenda. The Portis Report, um, Enterprise a, 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 and Business Community Inquiry into Town Centre both stress the need for public engagement. And that's... that's um, increasingly being said in government papers in the UK and also in Wales. And uh, I, I know it's a completely different regime, different funding system, different politics, but the need to engage with our communities is very, very evident, particularly by the ones that obviously fail, but also by a lot that feel quite disenfranchised and not able to be participatory in the process of development or improving or looking to the future uh, for their own place. Um, and also with a review carried out into the, the approach to regeneration in Wales by the Welsh Government, Crew and National Regeneration Panel and Consultants, the recommendation out of that came that partnership is crucial. Sustainable regeneration can only be delivered through genuine engagement with communities, local authorities and other bill public sector organisations, the third sector and the private sector. So I think everyone is broadly in agreement that we have to improve community engagement. The question is how we do it. How have we done it? Where has it worked and where it hasn't worked? And what can we do to improve on it? There's also the, the new planning bill in Wales, which I think recommends um, meaningful engagement. So whatever meaningful means, um, that's kind of where we're, we're trying to 
to under understand more. Regeneration cannot happen without the effective community engagement. It is those who know most about the area they work or live in and those that will be most affected by the changes on the ground that should be involved most directly in the design and the planning process. So that's a, um, just a statement. <coughs> um, so why the foundation? The foundation, as I said, have been involved uh, for a long time in the, uh, with communities and particularly uh, recently with the Localism Act um, 2011. And uh, over the last uh, year and a half, we've, we've, we've worked with 40 communities at least uh, up and down uh, in England in, in, in this role. And uh, probably had many more inquiries, but some, some, sometimes they get, they get stopped. Um, maybe they haven't got a, a well enough constituted um, community forum, or there's some reason why uh, perhaps, perhaps their boundaries are overlapping with another boundary, and there's, there's, there's lots of questions about exactly what the community represents. But once they've been given a pro approval by the local authority, then they can, be, they can go forward um, uh, to do uh, a neighbourhood design, uh, neighbourhood um, planning process and, and produce a neighbourhood plan. Um, <coughs> We also do something called community capital, which looks at natural, social, financial, and built capital all, all synergistically. We have been used in the, the recent past to, to, to value everything in a financial sense, and what we're trying to do through the work that we do in, a, in an educational way as well as an engagement way with people is to, is to raise the value of the natural capital and of social capital in any, any one village, town, or city, neighborhood, uh, as well as financial and of building. So giving them all equal weight. And it's, it's usually reflected in the kind of people that come on these um, uh, co uh, um, community engagement um, workshops is that you, you, you just get everybody from such a diverse background, but all of them have something very, very strong, very, very powerful to deliver and to, to contribute. Um, <clears throat> These are just some of the inquiry by designs that uh, the foundation are, are, are well known for. That's, that's a plan that came out of an Upton inquiry by design um, quite a number of years ago for 6,400 units, 13,000 retail, 28% open space. And that, <coughs> that was the scale at which the, na the, the inquiry by design tended to work at quite a big scale, cooperation with the, uh, the, the local council, the county council, um, and uh, the Princess Foundation all working together to get some kind of consensus on what the plan should look like. And um, <clears throat> the plan that before this one was done by engineers who said, why do we need to do any, any community engaging process? And the foundation said to them, well, why don't you just go away and design uh, a place? And of course, it came out as a completely cul-de-sac um, set of, set of uh, uh, neighborhoods, or if, if you could call them neighborhoods. And uh, that when, they, that when they saw what they'd done, they actually realized that they were kind of definitely on the wrong track and they needed to think again. So the process was a very helpful one in getting, getting across ideas to the broader built uh, environment. Professionals <coughs> and industry. Uh, this is Sherford, um, an extension to, um, uh, to Port of Plymouth down in the south uh, of England, <coughs> which also came out of a similar... Uh, a similar process, uh, an inquiry by design, a very, very complex one involving lots and lots of land acquisitions um, in order to create the concept of a new um, high street. And so the whole development is around a high street and about four neighbor walkable neighbourhoods that all link in within a five or ten minute walk into the, into the town centre. And um, uh, lots of learning from history and lots of learning from this sort of complex uh, settlement patterns that we are known internationally for. I England I has got one of the most incredibly complex and highly intelligent uh, set of towns and cities and villages that we often take for granted, but you get people coming from all over the world studying the complexity that is there. Uh, and, and the foundation tried <coughs> to do this. I mean, it, it, in, in, in our observation of other towns in England, it might be in the south of England, it might be in the north, it might be in Wales, and figure out what are the values that we can draw from those, from that learning into the, into the 21st century, when we don't perhaps have the money, the cash, the funds to build um, to perhaps the level that we have been used to over the last uh, 50 years. <coughs> it's 
that's that's another one on a smaller town, sort of half half within an urban area, half going out into a rural one. So, <clears throat> the Localism Act introduced uh, many new rights into England uh, to plan, build, to pl plan, build, challenge, and even bid in some cases for um, developments by the locals. Um, this takes community participation to a new level, from being passive or reactive to, to being proactive and leading the decision making, in some cases allowing it to, uh, allowing, allowing it to participate and lead, lead in delivery too. Um, <clears throat> so community engagement is an integral part of the projects at all stages to, to, to gather views on issues, both positives and negatives, and people who are living all the time in their own place are very quick to tell you what the bad things are what the good things are, what the challenges, what the opportunities are in, in your place uh, very quickly. So you can download that knowledge very, very, very quick. Uh, help um, to develop responses as well, to start looking at what are the options that will help to override some of the problems and the setbacks or, or to <coughs> enhance or strengthen a character or some specific uh, selling point for, to this town that um, might get lost if it's not really valued in, in the way it should. Decide on a preferred approach and to start setting up delivery structures and to implement projects. Uh, <coughs> so, um, make, making sure there's good representation. Key challenges and barriers, and it's, it's not all easy. There are, there are issues that we have to uh, face quite, quite, quite a lot of the time in, in, in all of these workshops that we're doing. Uh, make sure that there is good representation from across the community. That, that's, that's obvious, but it, it, it can easily not happen. And uh, it's, it's important that the community group or the community forum or the town council who may be leading it uh, will uh, ensure that they are getting good representation. And part of the process sometimes when we're involved in this in an earlier early stage is to actually help them to capacity build and strengthen the, the network of, of who, who it is they are or who it is they think they represent. Um, sometimes we have to deal with uh, sceptical or apathetic um, communities <coughs> and um, managing community expectations. Uh, let me have a look at that, that one there. Um, some communities have been, as, as you've probably experienced as well, if you're in a community consultation, have been well over consulted in the past but saw no results on the ground. So that's not a, that's not a good start, start, starting point. And often people say, oh, we've done this before. They, they haven't got the will to go through another one. <coughs> In more pr deprived areas, people are preoccupied with, 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 with issues such as jobs. Um, and so planning is low on their list of priorities. And that we noticed also a very north-south divide in England on that one. And if there is no imminent threat and um, things areas largely doing doing fine, then it's difficult to engage sometimes a wider community community beyond the small group of active residents or businesses. <coughs> so managing community expectations. Um, sometimes they can be a little bit over ambitious. Um, and um, those that had particularly bad experience with developments in the past want to be very prescriptive or stop growth altogether, um, which actually the legislation doesn't allow. You can't, you can't just stop growth because you don't want to have growth. It, you have to work with the council legislation. And as, as housing numbers are being allocated to growth in a certain area, the, the neighborhood plan has to work with the, the legislation to, to, to grow. Um, <coughs> And sometimes they're too sceptical, they, ca they can't see the wood for the trees, they can't move beyond the rubbish bins or the parking, unable and unwilling to consider the wider area issues and also understand and address technical constraints and viability issues. Uh, some are too co comprehensive and very general, repeating policies that already exist at higher level in high level policies in the council and therefore don't really achieve anything in particular. So what the neighbourhood plan actually contains is, is down to the local community to figure out for themselves what are the really important things about our community that we want to establish here. It's not going to be the same for everyone by a long way. And we've dealt with uh, communities which might be in a very uh, sort of deprived area of Birmingham. Equally, we've done very nice rural towns and villages across England. So uh, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of issues are kind of similar. Um, but... Um, <coughs> 
uh, and, and uh, we, we learn as we go. Lack of capacity and skills. Um, difficulty to maintain continuity and momentum. And rely, relying on a lot of people taking their own time to participate and lead. And the, the, the variance in leadership between one, one group and another and one community and another is, is phenomenal. Sometimes you've got it in spades and sometimes it's, it's, it's sadly lacking. So that is an, another issue, how to, how to work out, how to, how to encourage or how to support different types of communities. Um, <clears throat> confidence and negotiating skills uh, in particular. Um, uh, I'm still on lack of, lack of capacity and skills here. Good leadership, uh, most important. And the neighbourhood process often is highly emotionally charged and dominated by local politics. Uh, also because of the sheer numbers of parties involved, bringing it all together and teasing out the common concerns and responses, keeping everyone focused is quite difficult and re requires certain skills as well, diplomatic and leadership at the same time. Um, this is one that we did not too long ago um, in a small town in... Um, in the West Sussex, and uh, the, even before we got there, the, the, the proactivity of the local community had managed to deliver a neighbourhood <coughs> shop. They raised the finances, <coughs> the money, and they got it working. And uh, the, where, whereas the last shop closed about two or three years ago, they decided they were going to have a shop. And a bit like setting up a community land trust in terms of its uh, mechanisms for delivery, so they got participation and, and, and uh, buy-in, and it's, it's, what, it's, it's an incredible thrill. You could, you, Tesco's or um, anyone else could, couldn't really better it. <coughs> and um, so, so um, community keys, without any help from the Princess Foundation or anybody else, can do things, and increasingly there are mechanisms for people to be able to access for funds if you're going to set, set up a community land trust, get the right mechanisms in place, start to move towards something that might take you a couple of years, but in the end you might be able to deliver a great project uh, affordability in a, in, a, in a town and village for, your for the next generation. Um, <coughs> local authority, uh, lack of funding for regeneration <coughs> projects. The local authority, difficult to understand their new role. Uh, county councils in particular are so involved in producing their latest uh, structural plans and uh, delivering those uh, as they emerge um, and then have to suddenly d deal with a neighbourhood plan popping up with a, with a local community and trying to get their attention, say, hello, we need a traffic engineer over here for a, for a day, is that possible? Um, <coughs> is, is, that, that can be quite a challenge. But um, generally speaking, the councils have been quite positive, and I found particularly in uh, the inner city places where they really know they need help, they are very willing to help, and any help that they can get is just a big positive, and they will go with it. People who think they've got it all and they know it all, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a different story. And, and uh, it, it's, so, so the balance between communities is quite, is quite, quite interesting. Um, so, um, so let me just just point out here: the local authorities did, I mean, did finding it difficult to understand their role, not not as those necessarily driving the process, but as facilitators and providers of technical support, also difficult for elected members to relinquish control. Uh, and in, in, there is an inherent co conflict in that the government are giving powers to community through new rights, but national policy for pro-growth and neighbourhood planning re is regulated so that it, cannot, it, ca it, so that it cannot be used as a vehicle for NIMBYs, NIMBYism. Um, and complexity of the statutory procedure sometimes goes beyond the comprehension of, a, comprehension of many a local group, simply because everybody's a volunteer, you haven't got time to read all the legislation, you have to just go with it as best you can. But that's where the advice of others coming in from the outside can just give a little bit more tools to help people to understand what the process is and to follow it in a way that will make their resulting plan effective. Because if it uh, reaches an examination point and it, it passes the examination, and then it goes to a referendum and it, is, it, it receives more than 50%, then that, that, that document or that planning or the policies within that document become law. They become, have to become adopted by the council. So it is, it is quite a significant shift in actual power in the way in which the neighbourhood planning is working. And, and, and councils are sort of waking up to it gradually and figuring out how to, how to deal with it, how to relate to it. And, it, and it's not easy. <coughs> 
Um, so how have we addressed some of these barriers and challenges? Let me go through a little bit. The Princess Foundation three E's here, as uh, Andrew likes to call them. The engaging people, uh, bringing the, the, the right people together to create long-term practical solutions. So that's the key. Educating people, uh, giving people these skills, the skills they need to create sustainable and beautiful places. And uh, we, we're not afraid to use the word beautiful, as I, I tried to when I came in here and appreciated your nice room. Um, <laughs> Empowering people, helping people to make uh, change happen in their communities. So it is about empowering and giving people the sense <coughs> that they, <coughs> they can really make a difference. <coughs> um, <coughs> so I'm going to just talk about one of those is engagement. Um, yeah, we have to, yeah, with engagement, you're just bringing everybody together to create sustainable communities um, and good outreach. Um, Using existing community structures and events, don't try and re reinvent the wheel. Communication channels, um, no, uh, yeah, it, it is often surprising how much is out there, but how little people know about it or how disjointed it is. And the local planning authority has a very great part to play in that and does some tremendous things to support this process. Um, <clears throat> try different ways of engaging through walkabouts, programs with school children, social media, web techniques, communicating. I've been talking to Dave um, Adamson about this just now. Uh, however, face-to-face -to -face engagement is still invaluable. It's important. Go to people. Don't expect them to come to you. And uh, we've learned that the hard way a little bit on a few of our projects. Uh, community capital framework. Um, this is something I'm not going to go into, but it's just a way of <clears throat> helping people to understand the complexities of creating sustainable places. And it's just based on the, the four capitals that I mentioned before, natural, social, financial, and built. And then that sort of dives down into things like um, prudence, resilience, balance, connection, and root roots. And this is a kind of matrix of figuring out uh, what, what are the issues and um, <clears throat> helping people to realize that what, what they're doing is about reducing carbon footprints. It is about the long term. It is about sustainability. Um, <clears throat> some of the projects we've been doing around the place. Educate. Um, we, we do a lot of education at the foundation, but we bring this a little bit into, our, um, into the way in which we do, do, do the workshops as well so that people get a little bit of an input of what, what, um, sus what uh, sustainability means. Um, Capacity, build, capacity building. Um, <clears throat> uh, so I think I'm not going to get, dwell too much on that, but uh, education. Now, just having a look at uh, a little bit about the processes and recent, recent changes. The Localism Act 2011. <coughs> um, no regional targets but cooperate, freeing up councils, giving neighbourhoods power, powers to plan. So the MPPF uh, is, is trying to simplify. And I'm... I'm not a spokesperson for the government. I'm just telling you how this works. Reducing 1,000 pages to 50, easier to use pro-growth versus environmental protection, around new regulations, some, some consultation rules, but less jargon, blah, 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 blah. Um, and this one's interesting. Two types of uh, planning document that we, we have to use. The plan tools, I think somebody's put this together as a diagram of how the CLG process and uh, how the documentation decision-making processes happen. On the left-hand side, see how the neighborhood development plan of the, or fits in with the plan tools, and then on the right hand, the decision tools, the neighborhood development order, uh, so, so enabling um, the neighborhood plans to be integrated into existing uh, policies. Uh, and here is looking at national, regional, local authority level, and community level, and uh, again, just a sort of visual um, sense in which the balance of documentation or of knowledge or of uh, planning uh, is, is sort of being switched a little bit towards the community at the bottom, <coughs> of, the bottom of the pile, who probably normally wouldn't have anything much in this, this bottom right-hand corner. Um, so neighbourhood planning, the basics, uh, to really influence the local plan and local councillors and improve the quality and content of plans. Um, in area of parish councils, of which there's 10,000, the council is democratically accountable and responsible for the neighbourhood plan. In non-parished areas, the urban city parts of uh, uh, our country, um, the neighbourhood forums can be designed uh, if proven to represent the area which then take on a new function. Uh, opportunity to alter policies, to supplement policies with more detail, master plan uh, at a community, town, village scale, or give outline planning permission. 
set the parameters for good design in specific areas or, or on particular development sites. Distinction to be made between statutory planning policy to manage development and which must be examined to attain formal weight and community actions to improve uh, the look and working of local area and which are not dependent on planning or only provide guidance. This is another sort of diagram showing how it, the process works. Apply to the council, engage the community, check out whether you need um, strategic uh, environmental assessment, draft plan, and I'm sure a lot of you are quite well aware of this, so I'm not going to go on it, but that's just the process of the, the neighbourhood plan, coming right down to the referendum at the bottom, 50% yes or no. <coughs> um, so here we are, establishing uh, robust communities, addressing barriers, um, governance structure, um, especially in non-parished areas is, 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 is the challenge, and um, address delivery from the start. What we're trying to do is get people to say, okay, we're doing some plans, we're looking at a particular sites, we're looking at your town centre, we're looking at the high street. What, what, what one thing or two things can you do yourself or your team or your group to <coughs> affect change tomorrow? And it may be, it's the start of the meanwhile use, it may be some other thing that needs, uh, even setting up a community forum in order to deliver things so that they get a sense that uh, they, the responsibility is then, by the time we leave the workshop, they know that they've got to go and do some things and it's not just going to be left there. <coughs> um, so establish uh, robust communities. Um, just delivery from the start. Process is the key. Um, these are some pictures from this is this is one that happens to be in Birmingham, and you get the Sikh community and the, the local church community being very active in the way that this neighbourhood plan came together uh, with the the local council. So it was a real triumvirate of uh, people actively wishing and wanting to have a much better place to live, um, and you know so some real emotions pouring out on these on these workshops. You know, people with real uh, difficulties just with jobs, with work, and, and being prepared to let that come out during the process. I mean, when you're in a, in a, in a group like this, say, say we're all, all together here for the next three days, you kind of get to know people, you know where, where things are hurting, where things are starting to, to, to uh, you know, um, change in, in the minds or, or, or in the heart sometimes. It's, it's, it's quite, a, quite an interesting um, process. And it's, it's really quite a privilege to actually be part of that <coughs> as a facilitator only minimally giving your sort of technical expertise where you see it's needed, not just all the time trying to design the place for everybody. The process is a structured multi-day multi participatory design and planning, planning workshop, I think that's wrong, uh, good, uh, and a good method of achieving many issues as they engage all concerned in a single integrated process. So I didn't say that very well. Everyone has a, has a say, work in plenary groups, open public meetings, focus theme sessions, address technical issues as well as the community's concerns and ideas, address across the sectors, uh, and so, so on. Um, here's another picture, again, from the same group where they brought in a school who had been doing some environmental projects and working, and then they brought their results to the workshop. Um, provide support. Um, uh, obviously they need technical support, they need the uh, understanding of transportation issues which are often mega difficult to solve unless you have a real technical knowledge. So we would often bring in a, uh, an experienced traffic en uh, engineer with us on our own team who works with them, maybe the, the, the county council and, and others and the local people who tell, tell you where the problems are. Uh, advice on delivery and funding to make sure delivery issues are uh, addressed from the start. Um, here's some more active participation going on in that particular workshop. Um, despite scepticism expressed by many, we, we remain positive. It is good as local, as local knowledge is harnessed and a, better, and a better basis formed for successful schemes. And it's great to see communities being really empowered in that way. Um, I know that... Um, there was an article from The Guardian, which I read only just the other day, on, on the sceptical side, but uh, you kind of understand where other people are coming from about the big society, saying it was, um, the big society was seen as a fig leaf for the shrinking state and spending cuts, or is it a cynical repackaging of the civic activity that has quietly kept British society intact for hundreds of years? Um, 
don't know. It's uh, it's it's, it's interesting, wasn't it? I I I doubt if uh, I think this is a little bit rose rose coloured in a sense that I, um, the civic activity has kept British society intact for hundreds of years. Um, yes, yes, and no. It's, it's, so that's that's part of the debate, I guess you <laughs> you want to have later. Um, yeah, this is the same. This is the same inner city um, project I was talking about earlier in Birmingham. These are some of the sketches and drawings that come out from different tables as people try to tell you what's um, going on. This is trying to deal with some enormously difficult junctions that are splitting communities apart, of which I'm <coughs> sure you're all familiar. And literally, just across the road is this incredibly beautiful piece of. Uh, churchyard and church and if you uh, look at many of our towns and cities in England you find it is the religious armature of the of the town that keeps the green together and uh, it's, it's interesting that the church lent venues and space and uh, the Sikh community as well were working <coughs> together to allow the community to operate uh, these these meetings and try and trying to move it forward but um, uh, it's it's uh, and then tomorrow I'll be in another one up in, uh, in, in Derbyshire, which is um, a, a completely different again. And just, uh, just understanding the uh, settlement patterns, again, has, has always fascinated me. Wherever I go, it's always slightly different. And, and just the incredible complexity of perimeter block system, which has been used uh, for centuries and works perfectly well. You get adequately, you know, masses of green in the back block. So you get a kind of security uh, of natural surveillance, both at the front and the back. You have very defined streets. You have this incredible balance of the, the marketplace over here and the church and the castle, uh, linking together all this commerce and all this business and all this residential activity. And um, the planning, post-war planning, as we all know, has, has, has kind of decimated that. And we're all, always wondering what to do with the leftover green spaces and whether to put railings around them or to put another sort of road through it. And, and, and just finding out what are the essentials that are going to make our towns and cities great again and not to, uh, not to lose it. That's the a, that's a Princess Foundation um, slide, just simply showing post-war development over the top, uh, segregated and, and, and zoned, and, and uh, traditional urbanism below. This is just um, so, uh, a little bit of a, a comment on um, uh, different types of community consultation. And unfortunately, I can't, uh, I can't find my words on that, but it, I think you can, you can get it. Can't you? It's kind of manipulation, cynical, therapy, informing, consultation, degrees of tokenism, placation, partnership delegated power, degrees of citizen power, that's the sort of whole panoply of different types of community engagement. And I think increasingly well, what we're finding is that we do now need to be in the proper engagement, not, not, not in tokenism, not just like pretend playing a game, and, uh, which, which the local, uh, local people can see through. Um, these are just some things that the foundation, uh, <coughs> are, and that, that one of course, Coy Darcy, um, Penry Kyber, Poundbury, um, the Galapagos Islands, we have a team out there who've been there for a year. And if there's any unsustainable development going on anywhere in the world at the moment, it's in the Galapagos Islands. And uh, all kinds of sewerage and problem and, uh, of, of waste and uh, all kinds of wrong um, was that, suburban building practice going on. People sort of having incredibly bad health problems. A lot of the animals dying. We always think of Galapagos, oh great, you know, all those iguanas. But um, it's, it's a shambles. And so the work of the foundation through community engagement we've had two guys just literally getting living amongst the people and just getting engaged and uh, finding out what they can do to start reversing the the trend there just literally by building houses or building community centers or helping to reconfigure existing uh, uh, buildings that, that haven't worked very well figuring out what to do with waste working with the local government and so the, the, the experience of the, of the foundation over that time has, has enabled that kind of project to take place. And that's going on all over the world. And uh, it's a massive project. And what, in, increasingly, the foundation are finding themselves in the, in, with the increasing need to share knowledge and skills in this area uh, internationally. And, um, um, and it's not as if we haven't got enough problems on our doorstep. You know, in Wales, we have a lot of... Uh, issues of deprivation that we still haven't figured out and maybe this is a step towards working out how, how we can go one step further forward 
in, in bringing the communities uh, back into play rather than leaving them on the <coughs> edge. Uh, some more projects. Um, this is um, University Building, uh, Ericsson Building out in Canada, and this is uh, one in, in Jamaica. And um, I'm going to finish just with a, um, a quote, which I hope I wrote down somewhere here. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, it's from a Chinese proverb, and um, it says, and I'm, I'm sure you've all heard it before, um, tell me, and I will forget, show me, and I may remember, involve or engage me, and I'll understand. So it's a kind of process that, uh, that, that we all need to be uh, part of in one, one form or another. And on that note, I'm going to say thank you and uh, hand over back to Andrew. Thanks so much, Noel. Um, <laughs>